Welcome to all of you who are tuning in for our service here from St. Peter's in Lutheran Church in Joliet, Illinois. We hope that you are all well and strong in the Lord. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth but if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join with us in the Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen.
and also with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth, whom you promised from the Father, who lives and reigns with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for the seventh Sunday of Easter is from the first chapter of Acts. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about a hundred and twenty and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known as to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, al Kadama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, and those also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place, and they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Here ends the first lesson. The epistle lesson is taken from the fourth chapter of First Peter, and also serves as the text for the sermon this morning. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, 
what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here ends the epistle lesson. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given, me, given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
text for our sermon this morning is taken from the fifth chapter of first peter the seventh verse casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you please join me in prayer heavenly father in this time of anxiety we pray your words will bring us comfort and relief bless the preaching of the word so by it we may find strength comfort and hope in our lord and savior risen for our justification and source of life now and for all eternity amen the conductor of a college orchestra came down with an illness and had to take some time off this was not a particularly good time in the school year to do something like that because the big yearly concert was coming up. But nevertheless, the show had to go on. A young man, a young conductor, was called up to fill in for the time being. And as you can well imagine, the young man did not have the same kind of experience know-how as the older conductor, but he was willing to step in and do his best. When he met with the orchestra, he said that they had quite a challenge ahead of them, and this challenge could prove to make a lot of the musicians, the students, feel very anxious about their performance. But nevertheless, they were going to work hard and work together and accomplish this plan. The night of the concert, all the musicians came together in the practice room for a little pep talk by the young conductor. Again, he pointed out to them that many of them were feeling anxious about this presentation. It was a very challenging piece that they were supposed to do. But he told them that they had all worked very hard and that they would all do a good job. And, he added, if they came to a section of the music in which they felt they just wouldn't do the best job, that it was all right for them to be silent, not to play, until they get to the next portion where they can pick it up again. Everybody understood that the young conductor was really trying to help them in their anxiety. And they understood about not playing it. They didn't think they were really going to be ready for that part. The musicians and the conductor all went out onto the stage. And after they got done warming up, you know, they, each musician is running through their scales or whatever. And uh, the young conductor went up to the uh, podium and took his baton and struck the podium a couple of times, got everybody's attention, raised his hand up, and went one, two, three, and came down with the baton. There was only silence. Sometimes all of us get so anxious that we wish we could just be silent, to walk away, to have all the, the problems that are surrounding us just disappear. But that isn't reality, is it? Anxiety is not a rare thing. I think all of us are anxious at one time or another, not just in our life, but it could be within this year. And there is much to bring anxiety into our life. We have to struggle with it. Peter, writing to early Christians as well as to us, tells us that all of us have to deal with that anxiety. And in his epistle lesson for us this morning, he explains to us three things. First, why we are anxious, two, what we can do about it, and three, the hope that we have 
to help us through our anxiety. First, the source of anxiety. Peter points out three sources of anxiety. First of all, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's quite a vivid picture that Peter gives to us. We can imagine how much anxiety we would have if we were in the presence of a roaring lion looking to make us a tasty morsel of food for him. Why is the devil such a source of anxiety? Well, because he hates God. And he hates all those who are allied with God. And if you are of God, a child of God, you're his prime target. We've heard, sadly, too many accounts of terrorists who have broken into schools and have gone up and down the halls like a roaring lion, seeking teachers and students to kill. The picture is vivid in our mind. Other anxieties are also vivid in our minds, but all that is sourced in Satan, who seeks our weakness and exploits our fears. The second source of anxiety is that we live in a sin-filled world. It's all around us. We can't escape us. Even if you go to the most beautiful national park in our nation, and you're the only one there, we can still be anxious. We can still have those things that cause us to worry. Right now, of course, it's no secret that a pandemic is sweeping through the world, and that alone would cause us much anxiety. That anxiety is very real, isn't it? But there can be other things as well. Family problems, loss of job, not only the virus, but those things that bring harm into our life, who cause worry. Worry begets anxiety. And a third source of anxiety is our own flesh, our sinful flesh. Because we are sinners and are prone to the temptations of Satan, and often fall into sin. Sin itself causes us anxiety. Disobeying the Ten Commandments, ignoring ad admonitions, going our own way like our first parents did after they ate from the tree in the midst of the garden. Anxiety is a part of that kind of rebellion and that kind of sin. Like Paul, we say the things that we would like not to do, that's what we end up doing. So, what can be done about our anxiety? Well, to recognize that anxiety is a real issue, it's not something of our own imagination. If it were unreal, God wouldn't direct us to seek out the real thing that deals with anxiety. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Him is Jesus Christ. If you look at a thesaurus, we'll find many synonyms for the word anxiety. A synonym, of course, is a word that is like that word. Anxiety, worry, troubledness, etc. But you find very few antonyms words that are the same. For example, an antonym for anxiety would be serenity, peacefulness. But where does that serenity come from? Some people think they can find it within themselves. Some people hope that through uh, inward meditation they can find that serenity in themselves. But like we said, we are sinners. And when we try to do that, we can't find it apart from the anxiety that is a result of our sinful nature. Serenity source is peace. And Jesus is the source of peace because of his great victory over sin and death 
and Satan. Those things that cause anxiety, Jesus has defeated and offers to us the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that can only come to us through Jesus Christ. We look to God and he sends us that help. Think of all the people in scripture who had to deal with anxiety and how God helped them. Moses was chosen to lead the people of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. And when God said that Moses was now chosen, Moses said, oh Lord, please send someone else. You could just hear the words of anxiety in those words. God also strengthens people. Joshua had been given a mighty task after Moses, and that was to lead the people of Israel into the Promised Land. And remember, the Promised Land was not this unoccupied, wide open spaces that all you had to do was walk in, find out what kind of uh, lot you would like, and start building and planting and living. It wasn't that at all. The Promised Land was filled with people who did not love God, worshipped other gods, and would be a source of great anxiety in the future. And so Joshua had a very big job ahead of him. And three times in the book of Joshua, we hear this encouragement. Be strong and courageous. Now, believe me, Joshua didn't say that to himself in the morning. He didn't get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, be strong, be courageous. He says those words as a source from God who had given him promises. Or look in the, in the uh, books of the judges. You have uh, General Barak, who is uh, called upon to lead Israel's army against uh, the, uh, those who had opposed God. And Barak was filled with anxiety. He just didn't think he could handle it at all. And he didn't even have the right kind of trust in God. So God chose somebody else. That was Deborah. Deborah, a woman. Not generally the, the type of person that one would think of as leading an army. But Deborah was chosen, and because her anxiety was taken care of by God's promises, they went on to victory. When the people of Israel were taken as captives and dragged off to Babylon, there came a point in those 70 years that there was an order to annihilate all of them. God chose Esther. And Esther's anxiety was laid upon God's promises that he would save his people from Xerxes. There's a common thread there. The Lord promises and delivers his people. Finally, what is our hope? Well, God acts in grace. Moses was not ready to do what God wanted him to do until God promised him his strength would work through him. Fortunately, Moses had the faith to accept that and trust it. Peter calls us to eternal glory, to put aside our anxiety and focus on Jesus, the source of that glory, and also that promise of victory as he won it for us on the cross and in his resurrection he gives to us in our baptism. Our baptism is a source of great courage and serenity and peace to know that God has guaranteed in us his presence, his forgiveness, his leadership in our life. We're not talking Hollywood script here. We know that life doesn't go quite the way we would like it to go, and certainly not the way a Hollywood script would uh, portray it. But we know that God gives his promise. And no matter how things unfold, even if we have to suffer at times, as Peter, make, start, Peter makes that point, the painful trial you are suffering, 
Yet again, God is going to bring good out of those troubles and give us his leadership and strength. I heard this story uh, from another Lutheran pastor about two men who needed to cross a frozen river. Now the one man was using a, a snowmobile. Now you know a snowmobile can go pretty fast when you got it all cranked up and that's what he was going to do. He didn't know if that river, frozen river, would sustain him, but he knew that if he went fast enough, he might be able to skip through onto the other side of the river without breaking the ice. And he did. He had faith in that process. Another man who didn't have a snowmobile but still had to cross that frozen river did not have much faith. So he did what the best he could possibly do, and that was to literally crawl across the frozen river, to spread out his weight as much as possible, not to put stress on the ice. He too crossed that river. When they had to come back and think about it, their faith was not, or maybe it seemed like their faith was in themselves, but it really wasn't. The object of their hope was the frozen river. Either the ice is strong enough or it's not. That's the object of hope. Not yourself, but Jesus Christ. And we know that Jesus is strong because of his death and resurrection, his ascension, and now the promise that he will be with us always, that he prepares a place for us in heaven, and to know that through his forgiveness we have life and salvation. The word comes from God. He created the world out of nothing. That's the power of his word. By his word, Jesus was raised from the dead for our justification. The word has the power to put courage in the people, in the lives of people who have to deal with real anxiety, but they deal with it with the reality of Jesus' death and resurrection for us. In his name. And now together we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in prayer as we bring the concerns of our congregation and the concerns in our life before the throne of God. Heavenly Father, in the midst of our anxiety, you bless us with our risen Lord. Upon him we can build our hope and know he is with us for all eternity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who administer government and justice, who guard our nation, who are in harm's way, who are persecuted, who are church workers serving in the kingdom, especially Roger and Amy James in the Philippines, the missionary relief camp in Russia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our congregation working together to call a new pastor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the end of the pandemic, for those who need your healing hand, especially Lois, John, and Michelle Butler and family, Joseph, Janet, Michelle, Beverly, Colette, Evelyn, Judy, Norma, William, Mildred, 
Marianne, Beverly, Colin, Seal, Carl, Roberta, Matthew, Shirley, Phyllis, Don, Alec, the Whitcamps, David, Liz, and Adelaide, as well as those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who celebrate birthdays, especially Becky and John, Deborah, Jennifer, Lyle, Amber, Eric, Jeffrey, Patricia, Patricia, Steve, and Greg, and those who celebrate wedding anniversaries, Rich and Dawn, as well as Craig and Deborah, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the homebound, those needing your comforting presence, those depressed or weary of pandemic measures, the poor and those who live alone, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the families of our congregation who call on your name, especially those who must raise their children alone, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are out of work and seeking employment, for those whose work is dangerous, especially in the medical field, Lucas and Beth, Cindy, Dr. Ryan, Lisa, Dr. Bess, Sonia, Heather, Kim, Wendy, Monica, Rhonda, Krista, Tim, Kristen, Sandy, Tammy, Mary, De Devin, those who are first responders, Julie and Greg, and those who are essential workers, helping to support our lives and making our lives safer, and those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We join together in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.